Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 5. And we're going to start here in the first 16 verses of chapter 5, Lord willing, tonight. But the title of my message this evening is David Becomes King of Israel. After all that's happened, after all the delays, after all the uh, opposition, finally, now David is crowned King of Israel. Now, it's been about 15 years, uh, 15 years prior to this, that the prophet Samuel was sent by God to anoint David to be the king of Israel. And you may recall, David was just a young man at this time. And in 1 Samuel 16, we can read about that. But think about the incredible life, the incredible full life that David lived at a very early age. Um, okay, this, this is where I can get some input here. What, uh, te you tell me, what are some things that David did uh, even before he became king of Israel? Some, uh, we all know one big event, King David. Yes. Slayed Goliath. Slayed Goliath. Uh, and of course, who was it that was trying to kill him for a long period of time? Saul. King Saul. And he avoided that and evaded all those numerous attempts of his life. And after the death of King Saul, now he is anointed uh, well, prior to this, he was anointed the king over the southern uh, territory of you know, Judah. And, he did, and that was when he was 22 years old. Think about that, uh, the responsibility. Just a teenager when he killed Goliath. Uh, some would call uh, him a child when he killed uh, Goliath. And now he's, he's 22 years old. But after a long war, remember it's about seven and a half years that the Northern Territory was fighting against the South of David, and, um, but the Israel, the Northern Territory, collapsed with the death of Saul's son, Ishbosheth, and you may recall that in chapter, or the last chapter we were in, chapter four. But the stage was finally set for David to become the king of Israel, the second king of Israel. This is the promise that God gave him. Though it was over 15 years before this time, now it's finally being fulfilled. And just another reminder that though it may not happen in the timing we want it to happen, God's will is going to be accomplished. It, no one is going to hinder God from doing what he plans to do. So uh, let's read about this here in the first 16 verses of 2 Samuel Chapter 5. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou was he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old at this time. Now he uh, uh, finally becomes the king over all of Israel. And when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Jerus or, or Judah excuse me, uh, seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty and three years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Je Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about him from uh, Milo and inward. And David went out and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, and cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons, and they built David a house. 
David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. And David took him more concubines and wives of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron, and there were yet sons and daughters born to David. And these be the names of those that were born unto him in Jerusalem, Shamua and Shobab and Nathan and Solomon, Ibar also and Elishua and Nepheg and Jephiah and Elishama and Eliada and Eliphat. Oh, Eliphalet, Eliphalet. I get it straight yet. Yeah. Does it really matter, does it? But uh, we'll talk about that, uh, What, why I believe that's inserted there at the end. But David lived an incredible full life uh, after his anointing to be king of Israel. And, um, and after this uh, great war, uh, now he's anointed. I was reading an article about, uh, well, back in March the 23rd, 2004, Reverend Sung Moon, maybe some of you may recall that name, he was crowned as king over the United States of America. Did you know that? Yeah, we have a king. This coronation took place in the Dirksen Senate Office Building in Washington, D.C., when the Reverend Moon received a crown of peace. The Reverend Moon and his wife, this is worse than these Bible names, Hak Ja Han, uh, appear wearing robes of regal attire, and golden crowns placed on their, or had golden crowns placed on their heads during the ceremony, which was attended by a U.S. senator and several members of the House of Representatives. It was clear that Reverend Moon's followers viewed the coronation ceremony as more than just an award. On Reverend Moon's Family Federation for World Peace and Unification website, a few days later, top official, now this is a crazy name too, I, it's, it looks Chung Huang, it looks like quack, and but honestly, reading after what he says, he is a quack. But uh, it's K W A I K, so we'll call him quack. He was quoted as saying, so in effect, the crowning means America is saying to the Father, that is to Reverend Moon, please become my king. Quack went on to say, I just, again, I like saying quack, I know it's not right, but uh, the outside, he said, the outside view of the Capitol Hill event was that Father received a crown, an award for his years of dedication and leadership and reconciliation and peacemaking. The inside view of the event was that America surrendered to the king's position. Well, the Reverend Moon and his followers, they were deluded into thinking that Reverend Moon is the king of America. Uh, they are deluded in a lot of other areas, too, the, the false teachings of this guy. But however, no such delusion belonged to Jerusalem here, uh, to Israel. They anointed David as king over, over Israel. This was not just a, some inside thing that, that no one else really knew what was going on. No, everyone did. Now, everyone understood. David's coronation as king over Israel it must be understood as something unique, different from really all the other coronations. You see, God was establishing his kingdom. His, David's kingdom was kind of a little bit of a picture of the coming kingdom that is prophesied of when Jesus will reign on earth. And, of course, David was God's chosen king. So just a few points here. David... Number one, David is crowned king in verses 1 through 5. Verse 1 says, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron. All the tribes. Now that doesn't mean every Israelite in those tribes, that all of them were there. <clears throat> but they came via their representatives. Maybe some of them did FaceTiming or, no, I'm sure that's not it. But they, uh, their representatives, as it says there, look at verse 3, so all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And so the elders of the northern territory of Israel, they came south to where David was there at Hebron and gave, basically they give three reasons why they are convinced that David should be their king. 
took them some time. They should have done this a long time ago. If they would have been right with God, they would have done this a long time ago. And But now they finally come to their senses. Number first one here, uh, the reason why they wanted David as their king, because of a personal relationship that they had with David, of his relationship. Look there at verse 1. The elder said, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And the elders were clearly aware of what God's requirements were for a king for his people. When in Deuteronomy 17, 15, here's what the requirement states. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. Well, there they blew it already. Uh, for years they have missed that mark. But also one from among thy brethren shalt thou see are set king over thee. Thou mayest not see a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So they were all descendants of Abraham. And so the elders wanted David to be their king because David was their brother, a fellow Jew. David was not a foreigner, not a stranger uh, to Israel. And so that's the first reason. And then secondly, because of David's track record, David's reputation, what he had done in the past. The elders said there, look again at verse 2. In spite or in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou was he that led us out and brought us in Israel. Now it's interesting as you read that statement and commentators notes that the phrase in Hebrew for thou led us out and brought us in, it, it's an expression of leadership in a battle. And so David led them out against the enemy and then what they're implying here is not only did he lead them out and charge against the enemy, but then he brought them all back home safely, victorious. And so another way of expressing this is David had been, um, for many years, had been the savior, small s, uh, for the country of Israel. And so once again, the elders wanted David to be their save, savior uh, again at this time. Again, small s. Uh, then the third thing, because of David's divine appointment, and the elder said there again, the latter part of verse 2, and the Lord said to thee, thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over, over Israel. So about 15 years earlier, God had Samuel anoint the young shepherd boy from Bethlehem, David, in the presence of the elders uh, of Bethlehem, to be the future king of Israel, the future shepherd over all of Israel. And now the elders finally affirm God's divine choice or appointment for David to be their king, their shepherd. So after they had given David the three reasons for wanting him as their king, look at, uh, at verse 3. Again, there, if you would, the latter part of verse 3 says, And King David made a league with them in, in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he re reigned over Ju Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. So that's what they say now. They anoint him as the king and recognize him not as a king over a certain segment of Israel, but over all of Israel. David's coronation points really, as I mentioned earlier, to his greater son, uh, the one that would be, become through his blood, Jesus Christ. You know, we come, why do we come to Jesus? Why did you come to Jesus Christ as a sinner? When we came to Jesus because we understood, we needed, and then we wanted a personal relationship with him. And so there's a, a similarity here. Uh, David was uh, uh, related in the sense that he was a fellow Jew. He was not a foreigner. And then when we come to Christ, we want that relationship with him. We want him to be our representative. And, and indeed, by faith in him, Jesus Christ represents us, the elect, to God the Father. And, um, 
he uh, is there as our advocate. And then, um, uh, let's see, secondly, more, we, co we, we come to Jesus Christ because of his track record. Oh, what he's done. He, he came to die on the cross of Calvary, and he did that for all the sins of all of mankind. And he's done so much for us. And he indeed saves us from our sin. He indeed has made it possible for us to be uh, free from the dangers of hell and uh, from the power of Satan. So because of his track record, we come to him. It wasn't the church that was able to do that for us to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness or, or to give us victory over death and the grave and, and Satan. No, it was only Jesus. And finally, we come to Jesus because of divine appointment. Jesus was appointed to God or by God to be the great shepherd of the sheep. In the book of Hebrews 13, verse 20, it said, Our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of of the sheep and there is no greater than Jesus he is our shepherd therefore we lack nothing and David wrote about that in Psalm 23 so let me ask you tonight is Jesus your king the people finally came and said to David David you are our king you're the man you're the one that, and, and now they, they finally has, have come to this place. Too bad it took so long. But they are there. And now have we come to the place where we said to Jesus, not only are you my Savior, not only am I trusting you to get to heaven, but I'm putting you on the throne of my heart. You are my King. You are my Lord. And I am surrendering all to you. And that's what, uh, what the Lord wants. Is Jesus your king? Then secondly, in verses 6 through 10, we see the capital city is chosen. Once David was crowned king over all of Israel, he made a wise decision. And that was he was not going to uh, try to just please those that were with him. In other words, he, David was in, in Hebron, which was in the south territory, Saul, or, or uh, Saul's capital, was at Gibeon in the north, and Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was also in the north. And so David wanted to get a, a centrally lo uh, central location that uh, could bring all the people together. And so Jerusalem, it was right on the border of these, the north and the south, and the, these territories. The city of Jerusalem is built on top of a hill, and on three sides of Jerusalem, there is uh, uh, its slopes and rocks, and it's, it's very well or easily defended, can be. And so the city of Jerusalem uh, was the choice, and, uh, uh, but David met with some resistance. It wouldn't be right if he did, didn't, right? I mean, it just seemed like every turn he made, there was some resistance. And, and who were these ones that resisted? They were citizens of Jerusalem known as the Jebusites. And they were inhabited the land there. And they said to David, look again at verse 6, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Thinking David cannot come in hither. I mean, these guys were so confident. They said, listen, even if they're blind and lame, David, you haven't got a chance. Uh, you're, you're not coming in. We're not surrendering. They were so confident that their city was safe from attack that they believed even the blind and the lame could keep all the attackers from breaking in. So nevertheless, we read in verse 7, David took the stronghold. <laughs> Didn't take long at all. I mean, it's just one statement. David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. And then in verse 10, uh, why... Uh, we learn here why David was able to capture Jerusalem. Why, why was it? What do you see there in verse 10? That would give you uh, a good indication of why David was able to take Jerusalem. That's right. The Lord God was with them. And so God was with David. Uh, David was chosen by God uh, to bring the king, um, you know, to bring the kingdom here to do it things the right way to be that that uh, example or point to the future kingdom of Jesus Christ 
So Jerusalem became the capital city of Israel. Um, resistance and rebellion against David's kingdom, they were overcome. Uh, Jerusalem, again, was to point to that new Jerusalem, way off in the future. Well, I, I don't know how far. Uh, you know, a lot of it depends on when that rapture occurs, right? But the new Jerusalem is a place where resistance and rebellion against God's kingdom is finally overcome forever. It is the place where God's promise to Abraham to bless all the families through him, where his, uh, its ultimate fulfillment takes place. The new Jerusalem, Jerusalem is the hope of every born-again believer. And so when a Christian dies, what happens? His body begins to decay real quick. And they uh, bury that body in, in the ground where it remains. But meanwhile, as I say most every time I, I, of any believer that dies at a funeral, they're not here in that old earthly tabernacle, that body, now. They are with the Lord. Now, what are we saying here? Well, when the body, uh, when the body dies, the soul, the Christian soul or their spirit, goes immediately into the presence of the Lord. So the bodies of believers will be reunited with their soul at that rapture. When the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the sky and in the air there. And so we read about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, that great uh, rapture. And what happens after the rapture, after the Lord Jesus returns? There are seven years of tribulation. Of the worst time this earth has, will have ever experienced. And uh, then after that period, of course, we know the Lord Jesus comes again, the battle of Armageddon, the thousand-year reign of Christ. And that's really what this um, is kind of uh, pointing to. And then that new Jerusalem. Will there be, will there be opposition during the thousand year reign of Christ? Yeah, well, we know one thing, he's gonna rule with an iron fist. There's not now there's still gonna be people born during that time. There's going to be sinners around, and uh, but they're not going to be allowed. There's not gonna be any messing around here. It's not gonna be a, a turning a blind eye to people burning buildings and rise and stuff. That won't happen during the reign of Christ. I'll guarantee it. But at the end of that thousand years, that's when the devil's loosed and he will um, and still, it's, it's hard for our minds to wrap around this fact that here are people who have lived under the perfect reign of Jesus Christ will rebel against him. But then they were uh, are cast into the lake of fire. The, the uh, New Jerusalem is set up there and it's a wonderful thing. But in fact, let's, let's read about that place in Revelation 21. Um, Revelation 21. Look at, we'll start reading there at verse 10. Revelation 21 and verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a, a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gate gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles um, of the Lamb. Well, just describing the beauty of that uh, uh, new Jerusalem, but let me ask you here, just to wrap this point up here, are you eagerly looking forward to those future days? to that new Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of things going to happen before that, but you know what? Uh, once we enter the, the rapture, things are going to really take along pretty quick, and especially for those who are have been uh, uh, with the Lord. You know, our time is no longer, uh, we don't have the time restraints as we do now. All right, 
Uh, before we get into verses 11 and 12, are there any comments or questions you may have tonight? Do you want to, or just anything at all concerning this passage? There's a lot here. And I'm not going to cover every uh, point. I'm trying to hit the highlights of it. All right, let's get to 11 and 12 then. David's rule is established. Verse 11 says, And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons. And they built David a house. Now, some commentators believe this is uh, out of order here, or chronologically out of order, for it took place near the end of David's reign. Others believe that Hiram, who helped David's son Solomon uh, build the temple, was this Hiram's son, so who was also named Hiram. Either way, the point is made by the author here in verse 12. Look at Look at verse 12, where he writes, And David perceived that the Lord had established his king, king over Israel, <coughs> or excuse me, that established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. Now, that is a fascinating statement there. Uh, centuries earlier, God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We just talked about that the past couple of Sunday nights. But God fulfilled his promise by establishing the nation of Israel. Um, and after their exile in Egypt, they returned to inherit the promised land. And, and eventually God calls David to be their anointed king here on earth. And the reason God established David as the king over Israel is to exalt and to consolidate his kingdom. What? What for? Let's look at it again. For his people, Israel's sake. Now, that's real leadership. It's not for David's sake. It's not for just the king, but it's for the people. And Christian leadership is always for the sake of God's people. God forbid that any pastor should forget that to that mandate, that it's always about God's people. It's not about me. Well, we know it's first and foremost, it's about God. But then putting the people before ourselves. Whether king, whether pastor or deacon or Sunday school teacher, it's always for the sake of God's people. Leaders fail when they do not serve the people of God. I think a leader fails and they say, well, you know, that person's beneath me. What? Boy, I'll tell you, that's, that's, he's way out of line uh, saying that. Um, I, I, you know, we, we are, are, are to be servants and, and for the, the sake of God's people. So God made David great for his people Israel's sake. He didn't make him great for David's sake. David's greatness points uh, once again to his, the great descendant of his that came through his line, Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus, who said of himself in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, do you know for sure uh, that Jesus is serving you in the sense that he has given his life a ransom for you. Now, tonight, if you're a believer, now I believe we're yeah, with all believers here tonight, then uh, you understand that he gave his life as a ransom for your sins. And uh, so therefore, he did that because he is the epitome, he's the picture of a true servant. Lay his life down for you and I. And then there's another point here. Look at verses 13 and 16. We'll just kind of highlight some things here. The kingdom is compromised. Uh, in verse 13, and David took him more concubines and wives. David, David, David. Um, is it any wonder Solomon went to the extreme that he did? His dad did not set a good example here. He uh, took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron or Hebron, and there were yet sons and daughters born to David. And then a list of the names is given to those who were born to David there in Jerusalem. They're in 
verse 14. In one sense, the author of 2 Samuel may have noted this about David to show that his kingdom was growing and, and uh, growing politically. Remember, kings in those days, they acquired concubines, wives, children. Why? To show their power and strength. But I honestly do not believe that is why the author of Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel uh, put this here. And uh, because more likely the author here was set, letting us know that the seeds of compromise have been sown here. Uh, they were sown when David began to do this. Re I, re I, I read this last week, but let me read it again. Deuteronomy 17 and verse 17. It gives the following warning to kings. And this is just the first part of it. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away. It was never right for any of those men in the Bible to take more than one wife. That was it. Uh, God's divine uh, uh, plan was one man for one woman. And so uh, David was, was out of the will of God here. He began to sow these seeds of compromise. Uh, some of David's wives, and we talked about this last week, and some of the children that he had from those wives created a, a lot of heartache and grief for David. And uh, there's, there is a sense in which the author here of 2 Samuel uh, wants us to know that as great as David was, and he was a great man, a great king, and as great as a kingdom, his kingdom was, it was not as great as God wanted it to be. You realize it could have been a lot better. Uh, a whole lot better. And this is one of the problems here. Um, so, you know, I'm not afraid to talk about these things. And obviously, David himself, uh, you know, list his error, errors and judgment and decisions. But what I'm saying is some people, they want to point to this and say, hey, the Bible condone. No, the Bible does not condone more than one wife. No, the Bible does not condone uh, what, uh, you know, abuse and, and slavery and, and all of this. Now, the slavery in the Bible, it was not uh, like the slavery we had here in America. And, and by the way, it didn't start in America, did it? Not at all. Uh, they're, uh, they were paying off debts, and that's why they became a slave. Um, and any other type of slavery was not uh, accepted. Um, anyway, I, I digress there. Let me get back here where we were in Deuteronomy 17, where uh, we see that David erred. He went against God's uh, plan. The kingdom of God, when Jesus returns to the earth, it will be a perfect kingdom. A kingdom in which there is no compromise at all. And in which a, a kingdom in which there is no sin. Um, no one... No one need to have a, a lawyer because Jesus knows it all. You don't need, you know, any witnesses because Jesus already saw it all. And uh, Jesus, during, during his reign in the thousand years, well, he's not going to mess around there. He will rule with an iron fist. But, uh, but as great as David's kingdom was, as great as he was, it does not even hardly compare to what God wanted and what it will be when Jesus reigns. It, uh, the, the Apostle John, we, you know, he writes about that and, and there in, in Revelation chapter 21. We looked at a little bit about it earlier. But uh, so we, we looked here closely, and I'm going to wrap it up here tonight, at the establishment of the kingdom of, of, of God on earth. This, this is going to, one day, won't that be amazing, when Jesus Christ sits on the throne, man, we won't be grumbling and complaining. You know, oh man, we, there won't be corruption. There won't be uh, any errors of judgment. There won't be any lapses of memory on this leader's part. He will be and is perfect. What an amazing thing that will be. And so um, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, these verses that we looked at tonight, it, uh, you know, let us acknowledge and submit our, I guess one of the things we can take away from that 
is that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to be our king now. Not just in the future day of when he reigns on this earth. He wants to be our king, our Lord right now of our lives. We've all sang this song many times. In, in 1851, Matthew Bridges wrote this hymn entitled, Crown Him with Many Crowns. I was gonna read, I'm not going to read it tonight, but you can look at it later. A great song. But that's our goal, is we want to crown him as king in our lives now. What our, our goal is when we stand before him one day is to be able to receive those crowns to be able to cast back to him. And so the hymn is based on the Apostle John's vision of Jesus Christ when he comes back on that white horse in Revelation 19, 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. David's kingdom points us to Jesus' kingdom and to King Jesus. So I would pray that all of us, if we haven't done so, would acknowledge and submit to Jesus as our Lord and King, who should be reigning over us. You know, the fact is, he has the power to demand the Lordship and demand his position. But he gave you and I a free will. And we can choose uh, to either let him reign or no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on the throne myself. All right, any thoughts or questions or comments you have? Yes. Uh, for us today, there in Romans 12, where it says, be not conformed to this world, we can see that the nation of Israel was picking up bad traits from other countries That's around That's a good them. point. Yeah. Everywhere from even wanting a king to other wives and concubines and nepotism and everything else. Exactly. A good point. And, and the thing is, like I said earlier, God never condoned those actions. He didn't strike them dead as soon as they committed those sins. He still used them, but it brought a lot of problems in, into their life. And You know, you think about even our own you know, life. Maybe you've made some decisions that uh, you regret now, and you may have had to live with the consequences. Does God forgive us? Of course he does. Just as he forgave David. David was known as a man after God's own heart. That was after his sin with Bathsheba. That was after he committed murder, all these things. But, um, and so God forgives us, but you know, sometimes those, you know, the things, decisions we made in life, still we have to uh, live under the consequences of those. All right, any other thoughts, questions? Appreciate that. All right, well, thank you for being here tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll